What's up guys, Zach Hample here with you in beautiful Tampa, Florida. Well, not quite, it's kind of a mess out here today. But this building in the background is iHeartRadio. I got a big interview here today in studio and I thought it would be cool to wander inside the station, show you what it looks like, and then I'm here with Fenway Chris, I think. Fenway Chris, there's the man. And you can see he even brought a tripod for the occasion. Chris today, baby. Yeah! Tripod Chris. <laughs> so, so excited! Woo! Break my f***ing eardrums. So, uh, yeah, I'm holding a baseball, because why not? So, where, where did he go? He's, he's all over the place. He's gonna be inside the studio with me, getting some shots during the interview, so uh, not even sure how long I'll be on the air, so let's figure this out together. Let's do it! All right. So here's like a production studio where we do the commercials and stuff. Cool. What else can you show us, Mike? Come on. This is the man who has arranged everything. All right, we're doing a little press conference here later, is that it? That's it, we're set up for you. <laughs> Audio, video ready. Nice. No, you're good, man. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. So, I actually just moved down here about a month ago to take a job here. Right. But I've been following your YouTube journey for the last nine, ten years, probably. You want to say hi to you? Crazy stuff. Yeah, Chris Mathis, WDA. How's it going? Awesome stuff. Thanks for man. having us yeah, here. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, I'll be listening to the show for sure. And uh, awesome. I'm excited to hear what you have to say about your career. It's a career, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All the people out there who are like, get a job. Yeah. Guess what? It's very much a job. Awesome. Pleasure to meet you, man. Good luck. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, this is great. So this is the executive board room. Exactly. Real quick, how many balls have you caught now? What's your count up to? Well, I don't count spring training. Okay. And I got 41 yesterday. This will count. Yeah, wow. La Lakeland in the morning and then Tampa in the evening, but 11,659. Wow. Insane, man. So we can't film this? No, you can't can film it. Yeah, this is the executive board room. going. So as you can imagine now with all the technologies when we have our Microsoft Teams calls, we plug the laptop into here, we've got the camera, the speaker there, and a nice big TV. Hello, my fellow people. Hello, welcome to iHeartRadio. We're going to have a great time today, and I'm going to shut up and we're going to keep on wandering. So, um, I, feel like, I feel like Neo in the Matrix right now. <laughs> so this is new. People always tell me that I should have a podcast. Sit down, try it out. There it is. Record the first episode. How do, how do these things? Oh, he's audio cataloging this whole thing. I'm video hey. cataloging it. Hey. Hello. Audio, video. What do I know? What's up? What's up? Uh, you ready for it? Yeah, it's funny because I was just telling Ian about you last year, the Rays and the Red Sox. Oh, that was crazy. All right, welcome back. Back with the Retro 95.3 WDAE, 6.20 on your AM dial. And we'll be hanging out here in studio until 7 o'clock, actually. So I'm, I'm leaving at 6. You, you're out of here at 6? No, no, no. I just love when I do that to you and you kind of yeah. go, no. It's all good. <laughs> I, got, I, can hold, I can hold it down. Yeah, you can. Now, we, we were blessed to have a bunch of different types of guests in yes. the studio. Mm -hmm. And this young man, I'm pretty sure we're never going to have anybody that does this again. I'm pretty sure. No, 100%. <laughs> and one thing that you and I both appreciate, whether mm -hmm. it's sports or food or music, is like the guys and gals that are at the top mm -hmm. of their game and the leaders of their craft. 
Listen, Zach Campbell is the guy. If you want to know where a foul ball, a home run is going to be hit, he's going to be in a place and the ball is going to go there. Zach mm-hmm. Campbell joins us live in studio. Zach, what's going on, brother? How are you? I am great. It's really good to be here with you guys. And thanks for the nice intro. I appreciate that. Oh, man. we Again, we were talking about it off here. I told Ian about you, I think it was two years ago mm-hmm. or la- last year or two years ago. And then when it happened last year at Fenway Park when they played the Rays, and I saw, I think you were saying, I'm going to wear something yellow. And you were like the only person. Who went, and the ball went right to you. And I'm screaming. And my roommate's like, will you shut up? And I'm just like, no, this is great. And she doesn't care about sports. So I'm like, I have to call somebody. But first off, how did you get into this? What was your mindset of like getting into this is what you wanted to do? When I was little and watching baseball on TV, I'd see fans catching balls, celebrating like it was the best thing that ever happened to them. And I wanted to experience that myself. And it took me a long time to figure it out. I went to my first game when I was six, but I didn't get my first ball till I was 12. So a lot of games going home empty-handed. Yeah. And I finally learned that there was such a thing as batting practice. You can show up early if you have just a normal game ticket. Mm-hmm. And that's when it all started to click. And I could see that it was less crowded. Security was less strict. The players are more generous. And the baseballs started coming in little by little, but I figured out more tricks over the years and started to really pile up big numbers. Well, clearly you're an intelligent person because you flipped catching balls at a baseball game into money somehow. And I don't know how, I I have an entrepreneurial mind and I'm (laughs) tripping right now. I think it's a beautiful thing. At what point in your life or when you're catching a baseball do you realize that you could actually make money doing this? For me, it was actually back in college. My dad was a writer. And he just had a great mindset for maximizing opportunities and and coming up with creative projects. And he suggested that I write a book teaching people how to catch baseballs. So after my freshman year in college, I had some crappy summer job lined up, which fell through. And it was stressful at first because it's like, what am I going to do for the summer? But it turned out to be a blessing because my dad was like, well, you know, work on this book. I mean, we had talked about it leading mm-hmm. up to that. So it really became a project. And I went back to school for my sophomore year. I wasn't even thinking about the book. It's like, I wrote a book. Yay. I don't care if it gets <laughs> published. I can always say that I wrote a book. Yeah. And I went back to being a college kid. But then I found out that it actually got a couple of offers from publishers. And I was like, wait a minute. You mean I'm going to get paid for being a nerd about baseball? This is amazing. <laughs> and it took a long time from there for it to really become a full-time thing, but it's very much full-time at this point. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I see you all over the country going to all these different stadiums. And what goes into the process of, like, you know, do, is it any baseball that you get? Is it a foul ball? Is it just home run balls? Like, what goes into your selection? We'll get into the selection of how you go to certain parts of the park here in a minute, but what kind of baseballs do you keep? Well, I'm most interested in catching baseballs from major league games at major league stadiums. So, you know, I'm here for the week for spring training, which is fun, and I'm filming it all for YouTube, but I don't actually count those balls in my collection. I also don't count minor league balls. If I go to a little league game and chase the foul balls there, (laughs) I'm not going to count them. (laughs) But it's just major league for me. And my grand total, going way back to 1990 when I got my first ball, is 11,659. Wow. That's a real number? It's a real that, number. That hit your glove from a major league a batter. Well, it might have been thrown by a player. Okay, okay. I okay. might have picked it up off the ground. Okay. But okay. I have acquired Still, yeah. those baseballs. That's a lot of baseballs. But Hell I yeah. don't own that many baseballs because I've given away thousands. I actually give away most of them at this point. But I feel like the more important number is not what I uh, actually own, but what I've caught. No so doubt. What is to, that number? Well, I actually don't know how many I own, but it's... It's uh, definitely more than half of what I have caught because I built a pyramid of baseballs some years back, and that had uh, about 6,000 balls. So <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, storage space is definitely an issue. I mean, I <laughs> donate some to charity as well, yeah. and I, I try to not be a complete dick in the process of running around <laughs> and having my fun. Good for you. I saw you actually giving a $1,000 baseball to a kid at a Yankees game. Um, then you also you, you caught A-Rod's 3,000, 3, right? Yeah. Now, you wanted to catch that. When you catch it, you're celebrating. Everybody knows you have the ball. What happens from that point on? Do you still have that ball? Did you give it back to A-Rod? What happened after that? That was mayhem. And by the way, the $1,000 ball at Yankee Stadium. Yeah, I was with a kid and his father. I run a side business called Watch With Zach. Mm -hmm. And I happened to snag a Giancarlo Stanton home run during a game in September at Yankee Stadium. And I handed the ball to the kid. I mean, Mm -hmm. I didn't have to think about it. I'm I'm there with them for Mm -hmm. the game. So, you know, I figure... A game home run ball from probably a future Hall of Famer. 
probably worth more than a thousand bucks, but that's how I titled the YouTube video. I okay. thought it would help get some clicks there and it go. did, but yeah, the A-Rod ball, I was surrounded by stadium security and guards and undercover people. And I go there all the time, but there were people that I didn't even recognize that were just descending on me within 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And they all, they wanted to get me out of the section as quickly as possible yeah. for my safety. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to soak in the moment and I'm <laughs> posing with it and taking pictures yeah. and kind of losing my mind. But eventually, uh, I got out of the section and there was a swarm of reporters waiting for me at the top of the stairs with their microphones and voice recorders interviewing me. And I was just Incredible. swept away to, to meet with the head of Yankees security and he was negotiating with me. And then I met an authenticator. And I, by the end of that night, this was June 19th, 2015, by the way, I was in the office of Randy Levine, the Yankees wow. president, Jesus. who was also trying to get the baseball from me. Yeah. And I made the mistake at the time of tweeting that I was keeping it. And really what I should have tweeted was, I need to think about this mm -hmm. because people got mad at me for wanting to keep it, which is really not fair. You know, A-Rod is worth half a billion dollars. Why, why should some normal fan, some civilian be expected to give such a valuable yeah. object to a multi, multi-millionaire? But I did eventually give it to A-Rod, and in exchange, the Yankees donated $150,000 to my favorite children's baseball charity. Wow. Good yeah, it's called Pitch In for Baseball and Softball, and they provide equipment to kids all over the world and help them play ball. So a lot of good came out of it. I still get angry emails and, and nasty comments from people who are like, oh, come on. you know, hey, you know, you jerk, like, give A-Rod his ball. And then I just send them a link to the article about <laughs> What's it, it worth? where I'm handing it to What's them. it worth? Definitely six figures. Yeah. At the time, auction experts were estimating up to half a million dollars. I think, <laughs> I think more. Yeah. Because there have only been a couple dozen players ever who've gotten 3,000 hits. Three of those have been home runs. And the first two, Wade Boggs and Derek Jeter, the fans who got those baseballs, gave them right back to the players. So for a while, I was the only fan mm. in the world in possession of a 3,000th hit baseball. And A Rod is obviously a lightning rod of controversy and oh, fame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the J Lo, like he's just so well known. So, I mean, I, I felt like that maybe could have been a million dollar baseball. And oh. yet, it's not even the most valuable ball that I've caught. How so, about that? so, what is the most valuable ball? You've that caught? would be Mike Trout's first career home run. Wow. Yeah, 2011 in Baltimore. I think if that ball went to auction right now, I think it might. Uh, not might. I'm gonna. I mean, we'll never know. This is hypothetical, yeah. right? But. The most valuable baseball ever was Mark McGuire's 70th home run from 1998 when that established and finalized the, the single season record. Mm -hmm. And that was that sold for just a little more than $3 million. I really think the Mike Trout ball would have surpassed that. Because there was a Trout rookie card that sold for in that area. Mm -hmm. You're so, telling me that his first home run, mm -hmm. the actual baseball, is not cooler than a piece of cardboard? Come on, get <laughs> out of here. Uh, what do you do when you that. catch Trout's first home run? What do you do from that point? I mean, you can't so say, yay, I had this ball, and it's not authenticated right away. Do you have to get it authenticated immediately? Well, how, how does that work? Well, that's a good point, and there definitely was a lot of yay involved. Yeah. <laughs> But the A-Rod ball, since they knew that he was sitting on mm -hmm. this massive milestone, they had a guy there. They pre-marked yeah. the yeah. baseballs. They would the the umpires uh. would give the normal balls from his pouches mm -hmm. to the ball boy, and they'd swap in the specially marked balls. Mm -hmm. But with Trout, you know, at the time he was the highest-rated prospect, but no one knew that he was going to become Mike Trout. Yeah, right. yeah. So the balls weren't specially marked. So yeah, when I caught it, it looked like any other baseball. You know, mm -hmm. rubbed up with mud like they do for gamers. It was very empty that day. It was a snoozy Sunday afternoon game in Baltimore. Uh, it was 108 degrees and humid. And I was one of the only doofuses sitting out in the sun. <laughs> and I figured, yeah, I'll risk some skin cancer for a chance to catch this potentially historic ball. So when I caught it, there was no doubt that like I was the one. I wasn't buried in the crowd or uh -huh. anything. So security came down, and they're like, you know, we'd love to get that baseball. And I just said, I'm happy to give it to Mike, but I'd like to be the one to hand it to him myself. No doubt. Nice. And they were like, no, no, we can't do that. It's getaway day. They have to catch their bus to the airport, to which I replied, okay, well, if, if they can't hold the bus for an extra minute for the rookie to mm -hmm. get his baseball, it must not be worth that much to them, so it's I'll true. just keep it. Yeah. Oh, what do you mean they're going to keep it? And they get on their radios, the fan is being difficult, and I'm like, guys, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't asking for anything. No memorabilia, just wanted to hand it to just him. Just to so, meet the guy. Yeah, and eventually I did, and Trout was so cool, and I told him, hey, remember me? I go to a ton of games, you're going to see me. He's like, I got you, I got you, and I was like, He's never going to remember me, but he totally has. Cool, man. Uh, you know, he always says, hey, Zach, when he sees me. So it's cool to be on a first name basis no with the GOAT, you know. <laughs> so, so for me, that's almost more valuable 
than the money. I, it sounds like crazy talk, no, but no, no, I'm with the you. experience, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, the whole A-Rod thing, getting to return to Yankee Stadium a couple weeks later, have a whole press conference with him sitting up there. Mm-hmm. You, money can't buy that. You're right. So to me, it's all about the experience and the memories. And I mean, having the money would be great, but ultimately, I want the players to have their historic baseballs. You know, they're the ones that hit them. But with the A-Rod ball, I knew it was worth a lot, and I wanted to think about it. And it just so happened that because I held on to it for a bit, the Yankees ended up offering this big donation to charity. So people called me a jerk for hanging on to it, but look how much good came out of it as a result. So I I get it from all sides, but ultimately I try to do the right thing. Yeah, I was going to ask you that, and we're talking to Zach Campbell here. If you're catching a – if you want to see the guy that's caught multiple home run balls in the major leagues, he is the – the ultimate. Uh, how has it changed? Like, how is your perception or the player's perception of you? Do they think it's cool? Does some guys look at it like that's kind of like, how do they perceive you and being so good at something like this? A lot of players do recognize me. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of guys do think it's cool. Some guys think it's terrible. I find that in general, the more people know about me, the more they realize that this is a very positive thing. Yeah. And it's helping to attract kids to baseball. I try to be very generous with the baseballs, raising money for charity. But, you know, there's a lot of, uh, can I use the term, fake news out there about what a bully I am and how I steal balls. So Mm -hmm. for the person who's never seen my videos and maybe never seen me in person, they might have this perception that I'm really some big-time jerk that's knocking kids down and stealing balls. So they might come at me like, hey, what do you need another baseball for? I've had players kind of be snotty, you know, ask for a ball. Hey, you got enough of them already. But there are a lot of guys that are like, hey, put this on YouTube, and they'll throw me one. (laughs) That's cool. And, you know, some players even watch the videos and really like what I do. So Mm -hmm. I think it's becoming more and more positive. The more of my own content I put out there, people can really see what I'm all about. That'll definitely help. I think the more people get to know you. And I I know you went to one of my buddy's son's uh, Little League game the other day, my buddy Mike Barber. I mean, like, you don't do something like that. Mm -hmm. You're a busy guy in town trying to do what you do. And to be able to go and do something like that, to me, it speaks volumes over your character. Well, Mike is a great guy. He invited me. I I wouldn't say that. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) He's an okay guy. (laughs) I like that. But, yeah, he invited me. I met his kids before, and I just wanted to hang out and had a little time. So that's cool. why not? You know? So you have, I'm seeing here you have a fancy new glove with your name on it. Um, you have an amazing amount of followers and a lot of different uh, platforms. Now, do you have any endorsements? You get any endorsement money? Absolutely. Yeah? yeah. That's, you know, the big-time YouTubers, which I don't quite put myself in that category. I'm mm-hmm. like a medium-time mm-hmm. YouTuber. <laughs> working on it still, but yeah. there's like three main sources of income that the big YouTubers have. And actually, the revenue from the videos themselves will be third on that list behind merch and sponsorships. Mm-hmm. So my merch game, is uh, it's been slow to pick up steam. I'm actually wearing one of my own T-shirts nice. right now. But yeah, definitely sponsorships are a big one. And actually SeatGeek has been my biggest sponsor through the years, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the ticket company. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm just about to sign a contract with them for 21 sponsored videos this season. Nice. Wow. Three per month for seven months, April through October. So they've been great to me. You know, I, I try to give that back to them and, and bring them some positive attention. And, yeah, that definitely goes a long way to help pay for all the travel. You know, it's not just me. I also bring a videographer on the road, and then I'm mm-hmm. paying him to film, and I pay people to edit. I do some of the editing myself. So the sponsorship money is definitely helpful, and the videos themselves also earn a nice amount. So that's what, how I make it work. What's the biggest thing you've learned doing this over the years, whether it's how to do it, whether it's your interactions with people? What's kind of one of your biggest takeaways from your whole journey of what you do? Stay positive. I like that. You know, nobody wants to hear a guy complain who's caught a zillion baseballs <laughs> and who seems to go to baseball games for a living, even mm-hmm. though there is a ton of work involved. Nobody wants to hear me complain. You know, I've gotten in trouble on social media when I'm negative and I, I kind of snap at this or I try to make a joke and it just it comes off kind of douchey and doesn't mm-hmm. look good and mm-hmm. Just got to keep it positive because what I do really is positive and baseball is positive. You know, sure, there's controversies in the sport, but I just want to keep the good vibes flowing. So I think that's the main thing I try to do. It's important because we get some of that, too. Like we have a text line where it's just, you know, I, I always joke that I never want my mom to see some of these comments because they say some terrible things. And Ian, let's and read I, a few. And, uh, <laughs> Ian and yeah, the, the, the other day, Ian, it must suck to work with a guy that thinks he knows everything. It's just like, why would you say something like that? You know, when you would we admit 
on this show when we're wrong, right? We're very open and transparent about us, and we just look at it as we can't worry about that kind of stuff. We just got to rise above it and stay positive. So we're totally on board with that. You got to embrace the hate. I'm yep. telling you, way, when I was early on, I'm going to embrace the hate. It's better off because they're, they're at, least, at least they're listening. Well, as the Hall of Famer Reggie mm. Jackson said, <laughs> mm-hmm. fans don't boo nobodies. There you go. That's a fact. Now, I'm originally from Montreal, Canada. So oh, okay. uh, I, I was at the Jerry Park and Olympic Stadium oh, back in the day. Oh, there's a ballpark yeah. I never got to, unfortunately. Yeah, I was wondering. You're one up on me there. This, <laughs> but, I, but I haven't been to many others, but, so I'm <laughs> definitely not one up on nothing. But, you know, we live here in the Tampa Bay area. We went through the whole Montreal slash uh, Tampa Bay thing, which has been Knicks ever since. Now, the Tropicana gets a bum deal, okay, or or gets a bad has a bad rap, and I'm not here. I'm not here to defend anything. Where does Tropicana, where does it where's it rank among stadiums for feel? Because I've really been to Tropicana. I haven't been to many other stadiums, and people are like to bitch and moan about Tropicana Field. Yes, they do. To, to me, it's inside. It's seventy degrees, location, whatever. Just. The aesthetically, how does Tropicana compare to some of the other stadiums around Major League Baseball? I personally don't love dome stadiums in general. Mm-hmm. I think there's always a kind of weird vibe, and I like seeing the sky. I know it's not practical here in Florida because it rains yeah. a lot of the time. It sure does. But, in fact, I was at a game at the Trop where you could hear the thunder, and actually there was a little leak in the roof and some <laughs> water was dripping down. Uh, That's a Trop. But, you know, I think it's not as bad as people say. They've Agreed. done a lot of renovations, and some parts of it are really nice. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the whole area behind the Batterzyn center field, they have some really good food options there, mm-hmm. a little party deck. You can stand and watch the game, and it's actually quite snazzy. There are other parts where it's like, eh, this is not the best, but mm-hmm. yeah. I really don't think it's so bad like people say. Like, Oakland, that place is a dump. <laughs> no offense, Oakland. No, I'm no, sure no, you no, probably no. agree with yeah. me. But, like, they need a new stadium. Um, and probably the Rays do also, but I think it's very serviceable. All right, more with Zach Campbell on the other side. We're going to talk about how does he pick the stadiums and maybe a little bit of an insight on how he picks where the hell he's going to stand to get these. Does he have a magnet in his pocket? We'll find out on the other side. It's Beckles and Retro, 95.3 WDAE and AM620. All right. Good that was great, brother. That was great. Thank you. Look at this. Shohei. Taking the base on balls here in spring training. He caught any of his balls yet? He has thrown me a baseball. I asked him in Japanese for it. Uh-huh. Speak to Japanese? I only know how to say, throw me the baseball, please. Choto, but oro nagete kudasai. Smart. All right, welcome back. Beckles and Retro 95.3 WDA and AM 620. Joining us in studio, the... If there's a home run ball to be caught, it's caught by this man right here, Zach Hampel. And people always ask me, they're like, how does he pick the stadium? Like, what city? What goes into that selection process? I try to go to as many different stadiums every year as possible because of YouTube videos, really. I do end up going to some ballparks that I don't love, but it's like, well, I haven't filmed there for Mm -hmm. two or three years, and I I owe it to the people. (laughs) But I do love going to different places. If I only went to one stadium for my whole life, I'd... Go crazy. I've been to 61 different Major League stadiums. Wow. Yeah, the Field of Dreams game last year I was there. You know, when Major League Baseball goes and plays yeah. overseas and the wins and losses count for the teams and the stats count for the players, counts, counts for me. For yeah, I like the baseballs that. baseballs count, the stadium counts. So yeah. Tokyo Dome a few years ago for the, the season opener. I was at the Sydney Cricket Ground in Australia in 2014 when the Dodgers and Diamondbacks opened up there. I mean, Puerto Rico, the London series. I've been all over the place. That London series was not. Everybody was hitting home runs in that series. Oh God! I, you know what? I was getting food because uh, I because I want to do a food segment for YouTube. Yeah. And I think it was Aaron Hicks who hit the mm-hmm. first major league home run in Europe right to my spot where no. I was going to be. Yeah, yeah. If I had been no. there for the start of the game, I would have caught the first home run ever hit in Europe. Oh, but wow. I was getting food for YouTube, so. Damn it, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, right. So, how does the average game go for you? Um. So, say for that game. The, the ball was hit in your seat. The average game, do you sit in one seat the whole time? Do you, when you choose your, your ticket, you choose your ticket where you think the most home runs are going to be hit, and do you move during the game? Like, during the game, you stay in one place, or are you moving around all the time? Good question. And, and tying into uh, your question about uh, how do I choose the stadium, I always look for places where I can move left and right. Lateral movement is key, because mm-hmm. the odds of a baseball being hit right to you are pretty slim, 
and then you might have some tall guy right in front of you <laughs> jump up and catch or knock it down. So I love the stadiums that have walkways. If they have a whole standing room area, that's even better, like the flag court down the right field line in Baltimore, Camden Yards, or there's that little home run porch in Cleveland on the left field line. Uh, tunnels, you know, that that connect mm -hmm. the the seats to the concourse. If you can lurk there for a bat or two, especially if that connects to a walkway or any stadium where it's not packed and you have empty rows you can work with. So places that are emptier in general, I try to go to and places that are built in with, you know, the walkway. So even if it is sold out, I'm guaranteed to have some room to move. And mm -hmm. I will certainly buy a seat according to where I think the baseballs are going to go. And sometimes it has more to do with the layout of the stadium than it does, let's say, with the starting lineup. Like, there might be a lot more righties mm -hmm. hitting because both of the pitchers are lefty, and righties generally pull home runs. But if the left field configuration sucks and it's much easier to catch home runs in right field, I might go for right field knowing that hmm, out of the 18 hitters on both teams, maybe only five of them are left-handed, but maybe it's almost worth it to sit out there. So sometimes I'll go for foul balls behind the plate. Like in Detroit, there's a walkway with standing room built into it behind home plate. It's great for foul balls. I average about one foul ball a game there. So I try to buy a seat in foul territory as close to that walkway as possible. So in case the ushers are like, oh, where's your ticket? You're not supposed to be here. I can be like, actually, my seat is five feet away. And they're like, okay, okay. So I try to plan like that. And uh, it's uh, definitely part of the challenge, but it's fun. How much of, how long does it take to game plan for that selection of the seat or the standing room? Does, is there a lot, like, is there a formula that you have? I mean, you kind of articulate a little bit there, but do you kind of sit the night before? Like, in my head, I'm thinking, this guy's up the night before. He's got the lamp on the in his charts, hotel. The charts, the chalkboard. He's, he's like, well, Judge isn't going to play. He's 0 for 15. He's done for – like, how much goes into the preparation for that one day? Not a ton. I always check out the MLB milestone tracker to see if – Anybody has 99 career home runs, mm -hmm. you know, because catching number 100 would be cool. Or maybe someone has 999 career hits or, you know, just stuff like that. Because yeah. then I will pick a specific place in the stadium for that hitter where his tendencies are. But uh, there's not too much planning for the 30 different major league stadiums because I've been to all of them multiple times. But a game like, let's say, in London, when it was a brand new stadium, Oh, tons of research, looking at photos, the construction updates from MLB, group chats with my friends, fellow ball hawks. We're trying to decide where to be. Is there going to be a gap between the outfield wall and the seats? Can we lower our devices and pick up batting practice balls that drop in there? How about the bullpens for Tossa? I mean, it's just like we nerd out on that stuff and can spend <laughs> hours discussing it and trying to figure out where to buy tickets and where to be and what the strategies are. That's a beautiful thing. Now, you've caught a lot, a lot of baseballs. Some are worth a lot, but... Do you remember the best catch? Do you remember being at a stadium and jumping over maybe an old lady and mossing her or something like that, and it's like your best catch ever? You, you remember your best catch? Wow, you think my best catchers are when I moss old ladies? It could be. It could <laughs> hey, be. my man, it's <laughs> It could be. It's Get me. out of the way, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's me versus the baseball. That's okay. how I see it. Hey. Okay. Um, the catch that I'm – proudest of I think I mean there have been certain athletic feats that were maybe a little more impressive but the happiest I've ever been catching any ball and one of the most impressive catches was the last home run that the Mets ever hit at Shea Stadium their old ballpark I was in the left field bleachers and Carlos Beltran who's a switch hitter but was batting righty that day launched one I think in the sixth inning it was so crowded out there. I mean, just, you know, last game ever at Shea. In fact, at the time, no one knew if it was going to be the last game. It mm -hmm. depended on who won and who lost in various games. But I weaved in and out of people through a little walkway. And if you watch the replay of that, it almost doesn't make sense how I caught that baseball. I saw you, it. You just see a sea of people. You just come out of nowhere and you have the baseball. I don't, I don't know and, how you did And it. I remember I just I picked the exact spot where it was going to come down. <laughs> and then I even moved one step up so that I would force myself to jump for it and therefore have my glove above everyone else's hands. Like, I absolutely crushed that one, and it was a very historic ball. I got it authenticated, still have it. I'm glad the Mets didn't ask for it, because I might have had to say no. Yeah, there you go. The Marlins hit two home runs after that, which made it less valuable, but I still love it. There you go. Mark and Oldsmar here on the text line. Which ball did you miss that you regret the most? Jeter's 3,000th hit. Oh, off of it, David Price. You get close? You get, you get close? So... I did not have a ticket in left field, but I was friendly with a security guard stationed right in that corner spot next to the bullpen. And there were a couple empty seats early in the game. 
And he's like, you can hang out here, you know, if the people don't come, whatever. So I was there for Jeter's first at bat. The people showed up. I had to leave. And then he hit that baseball right there. I don't know if I would have caught it, but I guarantee you that my glove would have been within two feet of it. If I had, if I were there, there was a little space behind the seats. And if I'd been standing against the back wall and I had thought quick enough to climb up and stand on the back of the chair in the last row, I would have caught that ball. So that still haunts me. I mean, I didn't, you know, it's not like it hit off my glove or something, sure. but mm-hmm. it just drives me crazy thinking about the what ifs. Well, you made some great catches. What kind of a baseball player were you? You grew up playing, like I grew up playing baseball, loved playing baseball. Jay grew up co- coaching baseball. Did you have a baseball career? You made some good, great catches. Well, thanks. Yeah, I was a shortstop my whole life. I played up into college a little bit. Mm-hmm. Guilford College, got to give them some love. Tony Womack, a major league all-star, yeah. played at Guilford. So he's our baseball claim to fame. Um, you know, I only got 14 at bats as a freshman okay. and then quit, but I did get six hits. There I retired go, with a 429 college uh-huh. batting average. There you nice. go. So, you know, when I was little, I was the best by far anywhere I played. And unfortunately, you know, if my athletic peak were, <laughs> you know, 15 years later, <laughs> yeah. I'd be worth a lot more money. But, you know, yeah, I was, I was really good early on and then everybody else caught up to me, but you know, I. I could play. There you go. Yeah. Also here on the Bartow 4 DA text line, how many guys are out there like you, and do you have any guys you would consider rivals? Nobody is mm. like me. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, so there are a lot of other people who are into this. I have taken it to the greatest extreme, it seems. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been to the most stadiums of all other guys who try to catch baseballs, and I've caught the most. But, yeah, there are other guys that travel around to different stadiums who've caught thousands of baseballs. There are people who've caught more game home runs than I have. I've caught 81 game home runs, but some of those old school guys in Chicago who camp out on Waveland Avenue, you know, um, they they had a lot of opportunities back in the day before they expanded the bleachers and put up those screens. So I I have a lot of respect for them. But uh, yeah, I recognize people in every stadium and I don't have any rivals, really. I mean, I'm on good terms with most people. I was going to say, how is the community? Because like we talked to Captain Mike, big time fisherman, mm-hmm. and it's such a welcoming community. And some communities, they're, everybody's together and they work together. Too. But then there's other hate. communities that are, it's very, yeah, there's a lot of hatred there. So it sounds like everybody pretty much is, is pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, no matter where you go, there's always going to be some jerks or yeah, some yeah. awkward people. Uh, but, you know, I try to keep the peace. I think I'm even better at peacekeeping than I am at catching <laughs> baseballs. There's a lot of negativity about me online, but yeah. but in person, it's like 99% positive. I meet easily 100 people every day who come up to me at games, sometimes a lot more. You know, crowded Yankee Stadium in the summer, kids are out of school, hundreds of people a game. And I went to 101 games last year, so do the math. I probably interacted with more than 10,000 people. And I would say it was a single-digit number of people who had – something nasty to say to me. So those are pretty good numbers. I'll take it. Good numbers. You have a young man here with the Yankees hat on. You're calling like Fenway Freddy or something like that. <laughs> Fenway, Fenway Chris. Chris. Fenway, Fenway Chris, Freddy. yeah. My videographer. <laughs> your, your videographer, <laughs> Fenway Chris with a Yankees hat. He's throwing, he's throwing me off. Now, you're shooting a documentary. Now, talk to talk me about the documentary. What is it going to be about? Uh, how does it start? What, what's it going to be about? Yeah, so just to clarify... Fenway Chris, although I might have to start calling him Fenway Freddy from now on. <laughs> New Nick, he has many nicknames. There you go. Um, he's limo driver Chris when okay. he's driving us between stadiums. Uh, so what he's shooting now is for my YouTube channel. The okay. documentary is done. Oh, it's done already. It is done. Nice. And it is coming out in just a few days. Wow. March 29th is the official release date. By the time this YouTube video is posted, it'll already be out there. But mm. uh, it's a 95-minute documentary feature length all about me it's crazy whoa yeah where can and you get it? where can somebody get it i'm glad you asked oh. so it'll be available to be streamed online there are actually some hard copies of the dvd and blu-ray if people are into that but you know it's going to be on prime video apple tv voodoo the microsoft xbox store mm. um i'm probably forgetting a few but yeah there's all the info on my social media and it is one of those premium movies that you have to pay a few dollars to stream but Hopefully I'm worth it. And I should point out that the filmmaker and I have decided to donate a portion of our proceeds to the charity pitch in for baseball and softball to help kids play ball. And then, of course, there's a distributor, 1091 Pictures, which is behind all of this. Uh, But, yeah, Jeff and I are going to be donating a portion of the proceeds. So you get to watch something really cool, help kids play ball in the process. And it's it's just a magnificently 
filmed and edited movie. It's so smooth and professional, and I'm truly honored to to have this thing about me exist in the awesome. world. I can't wait to check it out. I'm, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. I wish we could watch it right now. Mm -hmm. We got one more segment to go with Zach on the other side. What's next for Zach Campbell? We'll find out. It's Beckles and Retro, 95.3 WDAE and AM620. All right. Welcome back to Beckles and Retro. We have one more segment with Mr. Zach before he heads out of here. Where, where are you going after this, brother? Where are you heading to? I am heading to Sarasota, weather permitting. Okay. It's been crappy all day today. <laughs> it has been. I told the bullpen catcher on the Orioles, Ben Carhart, my buddy, hey, if you hear anything before they announce it, let me know so I can adjust my plans. So sure. Haven't heard from him yet, so that's good. It's a good sign. So yeah. you're going to do a bunch of you know spring training games while in this area? Yeah, four full days, basically. I was in Bradenton a couple days ago. Yesterday, I did the afternoon game in Lakeland. Got 26 balls there, Jeez. then went over to Tampa to Steinbrenner Field, got 15 balls there, uh, Sarasota tonight, and then Clearwater tomorrow, probably just for a few innings, because I actually have a whole media session for the documentary in the morning that wasn't planned when I booked this spring training trip, <laughs> so I'll be doing that and then racing off to the ballpark for a few innings and then heading to the airport and flying home. It's crazy. My schedule is really no bonkers. Doubt. Let's go to Mark and Seminole on the phone line. He's got a question for Zach. What's up, Mark? Hey guys. What's up? Hey, uh, years ago, uh, I was I was saying that when the Rangers used to train in Port Charlotte before the Rays, there was a ball hawk guy down there that would set up a video camera and videotape himself, you know, catching batting practice home run balls. And he got into it with a coach for the Rangers at that time. I'm wondering if Zach is the same guy. Definitely not. <laughs> okay. Uh, that sounds funny and unfortunate at the same time, yeah. but. Nope, I never did anything like that. Wow. I is mean, that immoral? What is that? Nothing wrong with it. Listen, I, I, I wonder why they got into wrong. it. It's I, I, I'm with you. Like, you said something earlier, Zach, about how, like, people feel like they owe the players the ball. Hell, no, they, no, no they, you do no, not. Don't. You certainly do not. You it pay sounds your... like they bully you, too. It doesn't sound like they're bullying him when they have – Who's they? A little, bit, a little bit. Teams? Yeah. It seems like, like they're for they, big balls, like, for big big balls. Big big, big balls. Are we allowed to say big balls <laughs> yes, on the air? Did. Very <laughs> did. Meaningful baseballs. There we go. There we go. People often talk about, you know, I oh yeah, I know you like to grab balls, and I'm like, can we maybe say <laughs> yeah. catch yeah. baseball? Yeah, 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 there you go. But so yeah, in a situation, I'm with you, Ian. It, it seems like they're bullying. Like we, mean, that's our ball. It's our. No, it's no, not. No, it's not. I'm telling you what, they wouldn't have got the A-Rod ball from me. Let me know right now. <laughs> they wouldn't have got it. So you gotta, I mean, I bet mean, A-Rod better come here asking for himself. I may even try to you know, get a date with you know, J-Lo back in the day. But you ain't just getting the ball. No way. That's, the, that's the, young, the young man who snagged Barry Bonds' final uh, career home run, uh, I, I think famously said at at a press conference, you know, like they were asking, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to give it, sell it? And he was just like, you know, I'm going to send it to auction, and Mr. Bonds is welcome to come and bid on it. Perfect. It's his, he got it. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the astrophysicist, I love him. He's a big baseball fan, and he said that if he ever catches – a historic home run ball, he would ask for a prorated portion of the player's contract <laughs> for that at bat. Like, whatever you get paid per at bat, he wants that in exchange for the ball. That is amazing. That is very, very smart. But it's like if, if you if you give the ball back to the player, you're a chump and you mm -hmm. should have held out. If you keep the ball or sell it, you're a jerk and you're greedy. So yeah. you almost can't win. It's a very strange situation. Well, we had a situation like that here with yeah. the Tom Brady with yeah. the football. Oh, we actually yeah. had the guy on air with yeah. us as well. And it was the same thing. It was half the people thought he was being greedy. The other half of the people were like, that's a stupid that's business stupid. move. And yes. it's just like, you're right. It's a no-win situation. So – What's next? I guess that's the, I mean, where do you reach the point if you go, I've got it, I've done it, I've got enough baseballs, here's where I'm turning my attention to now? Or is this something you see to do the rest of your life? Like, what's the next step? What's the next step in your career? I'm going to do it even after my life. I'll find a way to catch <laughs> balls from the grave. Actually, Somebody's actually. going to carry around an urn with the ashes of Zach Campbell, <laughs> and they're going to take the, foots, the mantle from you. I, I love it. One time in Chicago a few years ago, my backpack was on a bleacher bench, and it was unzipped. Someone hit a home run into my backpack. No So way. just, like, put my casket in the bleachers. <laughs> that is awesome. And they'll hit home runs into it. Now, what else? That is yeah. amazing. But what, what's next? Yeah. Yeah, what, what, else, what else is Zach up to? Okay, like, I watched a couple of your videos. You're big into music. You had a whole wall full of, you know, mu musicians. Is music a love of yours as well? I am so obsessed with music I in my own that. weird way. I mean, I, I have a list of every song that I've heard since college that I don't like 
and I write a, I write a one-line critique for it. I call it my sucky songs list. It's over 300 pages, size nine font, single spaced. Oh, what's the one song that everybody loves that you just like? No, not good. Oh boy. I mean, I, I I'm gonna get hate mail. No, no, it's fine. Yes. No. But I'll, I will just say this: I'm a big melody guy. Okay. I love beauty. I love melody, and it transcends genre. You know, so a lot of the new music coming out now, there's like one note singing. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of, t like hip hop is fine, but can we also maybe get like a melodic chorus in there, mm -hmm. some sort nice. of bass line? Mm -hmm. I, it, it bugs me when there's just no element of, of melody or beauty, like no attempt for that. So It's amigos to me. Mm. Amigos. Fair enough. <laughs> oh, horrible. <laughs> horrible. I don't know what you're saying. You're just mumbling. You're, you're, not, you're mumbling and you're, and you're rhyming mumbles with other mumbles. Hey, mumble rhymes with and, mumble. And the N-word. They, yeah. they, oh. They're sprinkling an N-word yeah. in there, and they're like, that's art. No, it's not art. Piece of advice for Zach, we're not going that route. <laughs> no, we're not going. No, no, we're not doing that. that. Would be, going there. That'd be bad for your uh, YouTube career. You got that right. Zach, before we let you go, tell us one more time about everything with the documentary, when it's coming out, again, where people can finally get it when it does come out. Again, we're going to put this information up once we post this interview up on our page, BecklesandRetcher.com. We'll tweet it out. It'll be up on Facebook. So the information will be there later on as well. But right now, for those tuning in, whether it's live here on DAE here in Tampa or on the iHeart radio app tell us a little bit more about the documentary it's called zach hampel versus the world i even brought a postcard with me that i can love it hold nice. up there for everyone to see 95 minutes long and it's streamable as of march 29th so you know apple tv prime video youtube videos the microsoft xbox store voodoo uh, there's a whole different uh, set of ways to watch it if you're in europe i have people emailing me and asking but yeah i mean it's going to be everywhere so i hope people check it out it's it's really cool and like i said a portion of the proceeds are going to charity to help kids play ball good stuff zach you're a very interesting dude yeah man it's good stuff it's we appreciate i appreciate you coming in thank you for the good vibes good interview and don't go anywhere we'll be back we have halftime heat and then a great phil esposito or the other way around phil esposito then have that right, my friend. but don't go anywhere we'll be back on the other side back with retro 95.3 wdae awesome. all right man. that was awesome bro we're done here. <laughs> yeah. Let's go out and take a picture. All right. There's the man. Tell everybody watching about your NFL career. This man is a legend. Uh, well, it depends who you, you talk to. I played seven years for the Buccaneers and two years for the Philadelphia Eagles. That's about it. That's about it. I'm still alive. Thank you for everything. Hey, no problem. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks Let's for coming in. Snap. Fenway Chris, thank you. Billy Chris, the man. Yeah. That's going to be really good. All right, we got my eight pictures. This is only our second year doing the show together, and we've had some of the highest numbers on our show in the last 10 years on the station. So uh, once we, once I got the postcard about it, like, we got to get him if he's here, we got to get him in studio. Uh, that's such a big thing. The interviews are so much better. And you know, we were talking about sometimes we get texts uh, about other things that aren't great. Somebody texted in one of our big time listeners said that that was one of the best interviews we ever did. So. Thank you so much, man. Well, all right. That about wraps things up here at iHeartRadio. I hope you guys enjoyed this radio station experience. I got to say a quick goodbye to the man going to his office, Mike. He made it happen. I'm interrupting your virtual meeting. <laughs> I got my Reese's Peanut Butter Cups from the vending machine, which will be my snack on the way to, later, Mike, uh, Sarasota with Fenway Chris. We'll be lucky. Oh, that's the car key. Limo driver Chris nice. today. <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, yeah, we're out of here. Maybe we can make it in time for first pitch. And, guys, check the description for this video. I am going to throw a link there to where you can listen slash watch the whole broadcast and other info, the social media of the hosts. Um, yeah, what a fun time. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We are looking for the exit here in this maze. Okay. It's raining like crazy, so we'll see if this baseball game gets played. But anyway, that's it. We're out. Thanks again for watching.